But let's move into the final topic, one through 10. Uh, again, same way, I'll give Ricky's rankings, Dave will give his rankings, I'll give my rankings, and then we'll give our cumulative rankings. And before we do that, Dave, we just want to plug patreon.com slash podcast and most of podcast nerd. So if you want to check out uh, patreon.com slash most podcast, you can uh, you know help us out, upgrade our equipment, all this stuff. Um, at the bronze tier, you can join our Discord. At the silver tier, you can suggest topics for us. And at the gold tier, you can call in and uh, give us your thoughts on anything that you want to talk about, whether it be NBA, NFL, college, uh, nerd stuff, whether it be video games or some of the uh, movie news that's yep. coming out. You can call in and give us your thoughts on that. And then also, speaking of nerd stuff, check out Most Valuable Podcast Nerd. It's our new channel where Tool to Game is on there. Ricky and Dave talk about video gaming news and the stuff that they've been Going to get a whole loving. lot of World of Warcraft news <laughs> as that goes live with classic vanilla. Come the, on. The stuff that they've been loving in the video game world. And then also, uh, Rick and Johnny uh, giving their thoughts on the nerd world whether that be uh, some new TV shows coming out, whether DC that be universe uh, stuff. And movies coming out, yep. all that stuff. Uh, movie reviews as well. They uh, reviewed Lion they King do. not too long ago. What was the most they, recent one? They almost did Dora the Explorer. And there you go. I honestly was in awe of Ricky being like, I'm a almost 30-year-old man going to see Dora the Explorer. Like that one, I was like, mm, You get put on the list? You might get put on the list for you going to that theater. The yep. Him and Johnny getting put on the list. Yep. Um, anyways, <laughs> let's jump in. One through ten. <laughs> Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go to the list man first, uh, yep. Ricky Whitmer. Uh, at number 10, he put Eric Gordon on the list at 10 for the Houston Rockets. At 9, he put Gordon Hayward of the Boston Celtics. At 8, he put Tobias Harris of the Philadelphia 76ers or the Milwaukee Bucks or the Orlando Magic or the uh, Clippers or the Pistons, there whatever you team you want to be. Yeah. Uh, then for well the traveled. 7, uh, he put Joe Ingles of the Utah Jazz. At 6, he put Otto Porter of the Chicago Bulls. At five, he put Chris Middleton of the Milwaukee Bucks. At four, he put DeMar DeRozan of the San Antonio Spurs. At three, he put Jimmy Butler of the Miami Heat. At two, he put Paul George of the Los Angeles Clippers. And at one, some bum named LeBron James of the Los Angeles Clippers. Dave, give us your one. Oh, you said Clippers. Oh, fuck. Lakers are going to hate you. Sorry, I put the real, uh, I said the real kings of Los Angeles. Oh. Yeah, there you go. Oh. Just drive it in more. Uh, LeBron of the Lakers. All right. Thank you. Thank you. At number 10, I've got Joe Ingles. At nine, it's Brandon Ingram. At eight, I've got Harrison Barnes. Seven, DeMar DeRozan. Six, Otto Porter. Five, Tobias Harris. Four is Chris Middleton. Three, Jimmy Butler. Two, Paul George. And at one, it's LeBron James. All right, and then my rankings, 1 through 10. I have at 10, Gordon Hayward of the Boston Celtics. 9, Joe Ingles of the Utah Jazz. 8, Brandon Ingram of the New Orleans Pelicans. 7, Otto Porter of the Chicago Bulls. 6, Tobias Harris of the Philadelphia 76ers. 5, DeMar DeRozan of the San Antonio Spurs. 4, Chris Middleton of the Milwaukee Bucks. 3, Jimmy Butler of the Miami Heat. 2, Paul George of the Clippers. And 1, LeBron James of the Lakers. Let's do our cumulative. Dave, take us through it. Sure. At the real num- rankings. At number 10, it's Gordon Hayward. At number 9, also tied in points, is Brandon Ingram, but we gave Brandon the edge because it's Brandon Ingram. At number 8, it's Joe Ingles. At 7, tied for 7th, I should say, Otto Porter and Tobias Harris. I think that one we're going to hit up in a discussion shortly. At number 5, it's DeMar DeRozan. At 4, it's Chris Milton. 3, Jimmy Butler. 2, Paul George. 1, LeBron James. Never has there been such a lock for the top 4 position of a position ranking since this. Like, and, I think that's just by the book. And yet, last year, only one of those guys was in the top 3 because KD was in there. Uh, but KD's now injured and Kawhi's now a 4. Yep. Uh, so and Jimmy Butler's the only guy that stayed at 3. Yeah, uh, Jimmy. But uh, let's run through the old r- rankings too. Uh, Joe Ingles moved up from 10 to 8. This year, Brandon Ingram stayed at 9. Harrison Barnes dropped to from uh, 8 last year to 11. Jason Tatum is now a power forward. Otto Porter uh, moved up one ranking from 7 to 6. Chris Middleton moved up a ranking from 5 to 4. Uh, Paul George moved up from 4 to 2. Jimmy Butler stayed at 3. Kawhi was at 2. And KD was at 1. Uh, LeBron was the king of the small forwards for about three years there until we moved him over to power forward last year for Brandon Ingram. Ingram, I believe. Um, but yeah, those are those are the last year's rankings, and now on this year's rankings, uh, let's jump into two of the uh, the two splits here. First, we'll talk about Otto Porter versus Tobias Harris and Brandon Ingram versus Gordon Hayward. You gave me the tip off that you want to talk about Harris and Porter more. I did. So let's jump into it. Why did you put Tobias Harris over Otto Porter? I think that Tobias Harris has a more complete kit as a player. I think he's a do it all player because. When I look at what he was able to do for, you list off 
six teams. I mean, like, this man been everywhere. But specifically on the 76ers this year, he's going to be asked to do more because Jimmy Butler is not there. And he had a meh postseason at best, I feel. Mm -hmm. I think this year they're expecting a lot out of him. They're expecting him to be able to carry some offensive load because they did switch out Jimmy for uh, Josh Richardson. Very good player. But they also added Al Horford. You know, he's old, but he still does the basics very well. I think that he's going to be asked to do a lot. And my thing is, Otto Porter, he's not the he's not just the uber-efficient three-point uh, scoring machine that he used to be in Washington. I really loved what I got to see out of him I in mean, Chicago. He shot 48% from three in 15 games. I know. <laughs> I know. I'm not I saying he's he not just that. uber-efficient. No, I'm saying he's not just that. Oh, okay, I got He you. is more. He When he came to Chicago, he did a lot of things. He won us games. He put us out of the top of that lottery, unfortunately. Um, and that that's fine. That's all fine and dandy because he stayed with us this year. The thing for me is I just don't know if he has got a better overall game than Tobias Harris. Honestly, I'm still shocked DeMar DeRozan's above both of them. That's my biggest surprise because I, like I said, I've got DeMar at seven. Uh, Ricky has him at four, and you've got him at five. Yeah. So how well, how is, like, Otto Porter th- just succeeded massively with the Bulls, moved over to a to a bad team, and was able to step up to a much larger role. Tobias Harris now has a better opportunity this year to succeed. Why why DeMar DeRozan over that? Well, here's the thing is Otto Porter was 15 games. Yeah. So it's not for sure certain that he's going to do exactly what he did last year. And I'm not saying that that's what you that's think. Fair. Um, but I don't think it's for sure that Otto Porter can do that again. I would like him for him to prove me wrong in, in all, in all yeah. honesty. Um, do I think he can take a step up? Yes, because he plays very good defense and he's one of the most efficient players weirdly enough in the NBA over oh, the yeah. past couple of years. Um he's it's incredible. been over uh, a true shooting percentage over 60% multiple times and that's pretty rare uh, in the NBA. I think that's I think you know probably like 15 players do that each and every year. Um Otto Porter is typically one of them. So he's usually massively efficient. I just wonder, you know, with Chris Dunn being there and Kobe White, like what's the ball movement going to be like? And is Zach Levine going to take more shots this year? And now Markin's going to be fully healthy. And I know he was fully healthy for that time when Otto Porter was there. But mm-hmm. I, I do wonder how this this offense is going to work. And is Otto Porter going to be as aggressive as he was last year? And even though he will be, even though he, he might be more aggressive, he's not going to shoot 48% from three. I mean, let's be honest. <laughs> is that going to be Joe Harris? Yeah. So I think there might be a little bit of a, a writing of the ship there. He was well above his career average. Uh, his career average is 11. And he's He was at 17 and a half. Um, I think he could probably be around 15 to 16. Um, but I don't think he's yeah. going to be shooting 48 from the field, 48 from three, uh, <laughs> 90 from, from the line. Like, he was stupid good. He was amazing. Last year for the Bulls. So I, I'd rather see him kind of prove me wrong on that one. Um, and then with Tobias Harris, Toby was not efficient from three last yeah. year. And and he, he had more Not when of he got to the season. Sixers. Yeah, no. More, he dropped he, off. He had more of a full season with the, the Sixers. He played 27 games compared, compared to 15 games. Um, I just wonder if he can be efficient for this team because there was a disconnect on this team when he came over and he is extremely talented good defender good shooter i just wonder if he's going to get the ball enough and if he's going to get the ball enough in his situations to really demand what he was demanding at least contract wise and then also yeah. from, from the clippers because the clippers were brilliant in the way they used him um and 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 you know, we show that over the the, the year of 2017-2018 where he's averaging 19 points per game. And then obviously the first half of 2018-2019 where he's averaging year 20. Um, they know how to use their players. And I don't think the Sixers really found how to use him fully. Yeah. And I think that's my biggest concern there is that he's still going to be inefficient next year. Because although you have a great ball, hand, uh, ball handler and great uh, facilitator in Ben Simmons... Are the shots going to be the right shots for him? And I don't think they were last year next to Jimmy Butler. Yeah. And if Josh Richardson's proving that it can be the right shots for him and that him standing on the outside on the wing attacking are the right shots for him and he's going to be more efficient, we might see less shots going Ooh. Tobias Harris's way. And he's not an excellent defender. He's a good defender. Yeah. Um, but he's not an excellent defender. And that I might agree. be hidden a little bit by having great defenders in Joel Embiid, Ben, and Simmons, ben Simmons, and Al Horford. Yeah. Uh, out there. And Josh Richardson. You literally have and Josh Richardson. I think they have four out of the, you know, like top twenty <laughs> defenders or something ridiculous. There's Sounds something right. There's some ridiculous stat about it. Yeah. Um I, I just wonder if he's going to get the right shots for him. Where DeMar DeRozan, 
we know what the right shots for him is. He's going to be a two, a mid-range king. And here's the thing, Limited. like even though he cannot shoot from three and he does not want to shoot from three, the dude shoots 50% from, from two. And he's an efficient two-point scorer. And he could put up 20 a night on 50% shooting. Yeah. And that's the thing that you know you're going to get out of him. And last year he was a pretty decent a facilitator as well. He had over six assists last year. And I think that's something people are sleeping on. So, I mean, as an offensive player... If you're asking me who I trust more out of all these players, it's DeMar DeRozan because he's been able to do every, you know, the, the same thing yeah. for seven straight years now where he is a mid-range god and he's going to be able to do that and he's going to be able to move the ball efficiently. He's not going to turn the ball over where I don't know if Tobias Harris is going to have the opportunity to create for himself and be a guy that's near a 20-point scorer and I don't know if there's enough uh, ball there to feed all those mouths in that Sixers starting lineup. And with Otto Porter... You have Zach Levine, who was who scored over 20 points last year. Laurie Markkinen's put up near like 18 a game for himself. Kobe White is apparently going to be, you know, a, a scoring guard. I'm not sure how much time he's going to get, so I'm not going to say he's going to get over 10 points per game. Yeah. And Wendell Carter Jr. is supposed to be back at some point during this 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 run. Yep. Thad Young, Tom Sadoransky, more miles to feed. I, I think that Otto Porter might be the most efficient and well-rounded player when it comes to shooting from the field and shooting from the outside, and then also and from playing three. defense. Um, I think it's definitely a possibility he might be the best player out of these three play- players yeah. by the end of the year. But yep. DeMar DeRuzen, DeMar DeRuzen, <laughs> DeRuzen. DeMar DeRuzen <laughs> has proven it more than Tobias Harris and okay. Otto Porter have just because of their two new teams, uh, Tobias and Otto Porter. Um, yeah. DeMar DeRuzen at least had a more of a full season on San Antonio. And he put up 21-6 and was super efficient from what he does best in, in mid-range. And that's what the Spurs want him to do. I mean, the Spurs weren't forcing him to take three-point shots. They were like, no, you're going to be DeMar DeRozan. You're going to shoot 49% from two. And he did that. So and he's sort of out. It, it, can we consider it out of position anymore that he's now a small forward for a couple years in a row? Like, Yeah, because he can't guard threes. Yeah. That, that's why I'm like, is that weird or? No, because <laughs> it's team defense for them and every yeah. other player can play great defense in that starting lineup or at yeah. least good defense in yeah. that starting lineup. Um, and they have so many ways to hide him or, or put different players on them. I mean, can De- I mean, DeJounte Murray could probably guard threes. He can like, guard fours. Yeah, I, like, I'm not worried about him <laughs> defensively just because it's pop yeah. and they'll be able to plan around him. And he's still athletic. He's not like a, a lockdown, shutdown yep. defender, but he's not a horrible defender. Right. He's not like, you know, Steph bad or, you know, uh, Trey Young bad. Like he's he's a fine defender, especially in that Spurs that that Spurs system. Yeah, I, I trust Demar Derozan be more efficient for me. And if I had to pick a lineup of you know out of these three guys, like if I had to fill my my you know starting lineup mm-hmm. with a choice of Demar Derozan, Tobias Harris, and Otto Porter Jr. If I surround shooters, or if I sur- surround uh, Demar Derozan with shooters, like yeah, I'd be happy with that because yeah. he can be so efficient. He can move the ball, and he's not he's he's a very smart player. So. I think DeMar DeRozan's a, 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 a and smart And he didn't have a bad playoff player. run for once. He was not terrible in the playoffs. No, he was not. Um, and, and we not could, a trash bro. And, and neither was Kyle Lowry, so the trash bros needed to be separated so, for them not to be trash. Yep. Um, so DeMar DeRozan, Tobias Harris, Otto Porter, those were the three That's a clump. big yeah. ones that stuck out to us. Let's jump into the other two that were tied. Yep. Brandon Ingram and Gordon Hayward. What are your what are the outlooks for these guys? Both guys dealt with injuries different ways. Uh, Gordon Hayward started dealing with his you know coming back from his, his leg injury, and then Brandon Ingram was out for the last for the last half of the season mm-hmm. due to the blood clots. What are the expectations for Brandon Ingram in a new situation um, in New Orleans, and then Gordon Hayward kind of in a new situation, being more of a starter and probably having a bigger role in this Boston team than he did last year? Yeah, I think that Gordon Hayward should have a really good bounce back year. Like you mentioned earlier, he had some moments with that second unit late in the year where it looked like this was the Gordon Hayward of old. So hopefully that, you know, with him back in there, more minutes and in a more team-friendly environment with Kemba Walker there at his point guard position, I think he can do some heavy lifting for them at the wing position, and he should have a really good opportunity. But at the same time, like... I don't think his shot's just magically gone, you know. He his efficiency went down the tube, but he's got to give it, you know, a lot of time to trust your body again after a horrific injury like he had. And we saw him towards the end of that year really going and he yammed a couple dunks in, he looked good in the fast break. Like there's every all the signs are pointing to like this should be a, his, you know, year back to normalcy. I don't think he's going to put up 20 plus, but I think he'll be in that, you know, like 17 to 20 range on this Celtics team. On the other hand, B.I., this kid, I have such high hopes for. 
I've loved him every year since he came out, and I know the whole awful comp of like, well, he's big and long like Kevin Durant. Him and Kevin Durant ain't nothing alike. It was the worst comp I think I've ever heard in my life. But you want, no, Kyle Schwarber to Babe Ruth. Okay, there. That that almost made me choke a little. It's just, mm. Um, yikes! Someone said that. Yeah, after uh, when Kyle Schwarber came back during the 2016 World Series, like and he was tearing shit up. I recall. And everyone's like, "Yeah, he's the next Babe Ruth." Oh my god! All right, well yeah, that didn't pan out. Yeah, that that that's a that's a nope. KD uh, though, let's talk about KD Brandon Ingram. <laughs> also a nope. <laughs> um, for me, I look at Brandon Ingram. I just go, "You have all this talent when you get to play ISO, like when you put the ball in his hands." We saw a trail of success for when LeBron James was out, Lonzo was not healthy, so it was like it's the it's the Brandon Ingram show, and he balled out in those games. He had a stretch where, if you take I think from let me get this right, uh, from like the middle of January to his final game, he was putting up twenty three points a game, five boards, three assists on 55 from the field, 40 from three, only 1.9 attempts a game, and 78 from or 75 from the line on six attempts. And he had multiple games in there. He had like a 36-point game, 32-point game, 31-point uh, game, 27, 29. Like, he was a monster. You put the ball in his hands, and he will succeed. Now, knowing that this Pelicans team, you know, all right, well, that's how you make Brent Ingram good. So we've got Lonzo Ball, who is a touch passer. We've got... Uh, a great two guard in Drew Holiday, who again doesn't necessarily need to keep the ball in his hands to make an offense work. We know that he is, you know, good at just being able to take his efficient shots and continue the ball movement. So I'm really hoping that we see like a Brandon Ingram heavy ball style offense. And yes, I'd be stupid to not say Zion Williamson is going to get the majority of touches. But I don't think he needs to like ball hog. I, I think Zion is very much you can throw him oops, you can let him run the fast break. And then in situations where you get lower in the clock, you can dish to him and know that you're going to get a pretty high quality shot out of him. Yeah. So I really look to see this Pelicans team let Brennan Ingram run the offensive sets for the majority of them because I, or at least give him a above 35% share because yeah. he really excels with the ball in his hands. How do you think it's just going to work, though? Because you have two guys that aren't. I mean, you, you need Zion. You don't really need Zion to set, have set, set someone to let, let me put it this way. <laughs> you have two guards that excel at feeding guys the ball. Right. Lonzo Ball, Drew Holiday. Yeah. How is that going to work out with two guys that need the ball in their hands in Brandon Ingram and Zion Williamson? And, and in ways of not like catch and shoot guys or yep. setting them up, how are that? how is that combo of Ingram and Williamson going to pair with Lonzo and Holiday? It's a great question. Honestly, it is because they're very – differing play styles between them and how, how they're going to make that succeed. I really do see Zion and Zoe being like the fast break. Like that is how you run every up tempo, every offensive set that you want that to move the ball quickly, score quickly, and just be kind of like a game changing moment. Meanwhile, Drew and BI can run the majority of sets on that offense when you need to either slow things down or just your natural offensive flow. I think both of those guys, I would trust way more than Lonzo right now. I could be wrong. Lonzo could work on his game. Like he's a he's a good facilitator, but it, it was never like the long possession facilitation like Rondo. Rondo sets an offense. He knows the sets. He runs guys. He you know gets himself into great positions. He gets other guys into better positions for them to take advantage of it. Zo is more of a touch passer. He keeps that offense rolling. And I think that's the thing is you're gonna let two guys take the fast breaks, take the transitions, take anything that you need up tempo. And let Drew and Bi run it the rest of the time. Right. I mean, I'm, I'm interested to see what Brandon Ingram can do because I mean, I as long as he can stay so healthy, because it is definitely a serious injury that he's dealing with. Yeah. Um. I, I'm not gonna. I, you know what? No, I'm gonna butcher it. Let's let's butcher it. Um. Because I, I going medical. Know, I don't know how to say it. I'm not a doctor, but let's butcher it. Yep. Deep venous thrombosis. Yeah. That could be right. TVT. That's what he's dealing with. I mean, we yep. don't know what the effects are on that, and that's going to be the biggest concern for me. Um, but literally, I mean, if Brandon Ingram is able to shoot from the outside efficiently, more, more efficiently, like he was in a sophomore year, yeah. if he's hitting 39% from, from the outside and, and he's able to be a better free throw shooter, like, honestly, this kid could be top five. Oh, he's a stud. I mean, he's he's a, he's an offensive wizard. 
um, when it, it, you know, at least from what he can do, what, like what he does best, he's an offensive wizard, and that, that's why I went to. He uh, has right a great floater mid range game. He knows how to control his body, and mm-hmm. he's again and his body's so unique. His body is unique, and he plays great defense with that. So I think you can't overlook the fact that he just has a unique skill set to abuse people at the three. And who's the most yeah. important player to the Pelican success this year? You think still Zion. You think? I can't not say the word Zion. Like, I mean, but but I don't he, even know what he's gonna do, and I just Zion. But here's the thing. Here's like we we expect Zion to do well, right? Yes. We expect Ingram to do well. We expect Drew Holiday to do well. I think Ingram's the question mark out of that group because Lonzo, we know what he does if he's healthy. You don't think Lonzo's the biggest question mark though? No. I, I I've already decided what Lonzo is. I've <laughs> I'm not going to... What is Lonzo? If Lonzo comes out with a three-point shot that starts above his shoulder, you know, dead center on his body, I'm going to be like, what the shit? <laughs> um, no, he's a, he's a, he's a above-average defender. He's a above-average passer, but he is not going to change the world as far as his shot creation. Like, it, it's just not. His shot motion does not let him take easy shots. So, that's I've, I've capped him. He's, he's great. You know, they obviously mm-hmm. can win more games because that backcourt is like one of the best defensive backcourts in the NBA. But you're right, getting BI the ball is gonna be hard for them at times. I, I want them to force it through him though. Like if he's not getting fifteen shots a night, something's wrong yeah. in my mind. Who 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 should suffer the most then? Like uh, who, Lonzo. Who, Lonzo should suffer. Lonzo the most, should not take shots. Okay. Like unless unless he's wide open. <laughs> Like, I want it to be just like... Unless you're in the fast break, kid. <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> um, all right, let's move away from that. Um, let's mention your boy Jingles, because you've been the highest on him forever, and now you have him the lowest. Uh, you have him at 10, I had him at 9, and then uh, Ricky had him at 7. Yeah. Last year, you had Jingles at 10, um, which was uh, tied for the highest with Ricky. Ricky also had a 10. And then the year before, where did you have Jingles? You had Jingles at twenty two, which was tied for me, I will say. But you've been uh, you've been on the Jingles bandwagon. I've for been a long ahead of the, I've been ahead of the train, and now you're behind the train. So what's up Am with the I Jingles really? train? It just I think it's the, a matter of the the personnel around him this year is going to affect him the most. Like I, I like the personnel. Oh, around I him, love though. the personnel around him. The problem is that he doesn't necessarily. I don't think he's going to get as many shots a game. I'll be honest. He's an efficient shooter, though. Last year, he did shoot uh, 44-39, and what's his line? 70% from the line, but it was only like one attempt a game. Yeah. So no big deal there. But Joe, really, the best part about him is he is a point forward. And like this man is a floor general facilitator. Like He can do it all. It's awesome. You watch him out there, and I know he had this... Um, I think his son uh, was diagnosed with autism, and they did a charity... Uh, event tie into a game, whereas every assist would be a donation towards that. And I think Joe had like 10 assists or 11 assists, something ridiculous in that game. It's a great story, but like Joe is just a fantastic all around player and he knows his role on that team. And I think with the addition of Boyan, someone who we watched at the end of last year really take over, um, I really don't think that offensively he's going to be asked to do a lot. I think he's a 10 point a game score, maybe, maybe between 12. 10 and you know 14 tops but like that's not really your job joe like your job is to keep that offense rolling your job is to be able to create for others and set up your team for better success like he can take shots and make them he can knock them down like nobody's business but that's not what they're going to be asking from him this year in my mind you are correct that joe ingles son uh jacob was uh diagnosed with autism uh came out around february 2nd uh, that him and his wife announced that, and I believe the game that you're talking about the was sixth. Uh, the sixth against yep. Phoenix, where he had 11, 11 assists. Yeah. Um, but even then, there was games after that where you had 10, 11, 10, uh, 14 in one of them, too, 13 against Denver. Uh, Jingles and Derek Favors were, were one hell of a tandem to watch, and I can't. I, yeah. I, I, I'm interested to see what him and Boyan can do. Um, I mean, he was I, like I the true point guard on that team, back. but yeah. now that you add in Mike Conley. Like that's the thing is like role wise. But here's the thing: Conley and you have, Boyan. You get have added. four guys. <laughs> yeah, four players in Conley, uh, Donovan, mm-hmm. Boyan, and Jingles. Yep. Who can all facilitate? Yeah. And who can all ball handle? Oh, they're who terrifying. Can, who can all create? And then you have the monster that is Rudy Gobert, and he's their best player. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's crazy. Like, this team could be really good. Yeah. Uh, they're definitely the most slept-on team in the NBA because it's not sexy, but mm-hmm. they do everything right, and that's the thing. It's like, defensively, they're going to be terrifying. Offensively, yeah. like you said, everyone can move the ball. Everyone can get their own. So I'm going to be really intrigued to see 
The problem from last year was really they ran into the buzzsaw that is Houston, and they could not hit a goddamn shot. Yeah. And it was just painful to watch. Well, so they went out and got somebody. And they got two guys. <laughs> You're right. Too. They got two so, guys. I, and I think the, the, the coolest thing, at least for uh, – I, I think the, the biggest thing, too, is, like, they're sleeping on them because defensively – you know, Donovan Mitchell's really the only like scorer that's jumping off the page. Like Conley's right. a good scorer, but like it's nothing like flashy, right? right? Like he's he's gonna put up twenty at the max, but he'll put up twenty every single game. Um mm-hmm. where Donovan Mitchell can like drop forty. But <laughs> And he does it with authority. Their, their, their best player is Rudy Gobert and yeah. he plays defense and that's not sexy. Um but they also have a psychopath as their head coach <laughs> in Quinn Snyder. So I I honestly think that this team could be disgusting this year yeah um let's move to the top four and we really we could be brief on this um why chris mid for you over demar tobias and, and otto porter because ricky didn't have that um ricky had uh, chris mid at five and demar above him uh what about chris mid might people be sleeping on or at least not be seeing about him and what makes him a top four small forward in your mind uh, he is really good at basketball. That's the Thanks, analysis Dave. you guys came for, right? Thank you, Dave. Look, he is big for his size. Uh, big for his size. He's big for his position. He's six eight. He's got a great shot from the outside. He gets better opportunities and better looks because he's playing next to Giannis, and he has a five at Brook Lopez who stretched the floor out. Like everything looked right for him. He was a monster in the playoffs uh, two years ago against the Celtics and then that continued into even better play from him the following year and then this year solid performance in the playoffs I really he did get the nod for the all-star game which I feel like I, I'm kind of on the fence if he deserved that one or not and Bucks fans you can tell me if I'm wrong on that I just felt like he was not um there were there were a couple other guys who were in the same running for that mm-hmm. all-star vote but no he he started off the uh, playoffs are really strong against Detroit, Boston. Another great series. He did ha- he did struggle against Toronto, but to be fair, Toronto, he had a he had that thirty point game, but that was about it. That was about it. Mm-hmm. He's just very good. Like, yeah, I mean, he's a great shooter. He's a great defender. He's long. He's strong. He rebounds well. He can pass, and he's a perfect complementary piece next to Giannis. That's the thing is, and, and I mean, he's going to be. I think probably, I mean, he was massively efficient last year, too, at like seven threes per game, shooting 37%. Yeah. Uh, but it's the defense that really stuck out to me was, you know, he was efficient and that's going to help Giannis. But even if he's not efficient, you still have Giannis and Giannis will make guys better. Mm-hmm. And with Bud's now, uh, you know, the adaptation of adding Bud to the offense for the Bucks, that's going to make everything flow quicker and easier. So, I mean, Chris Mid's going to get open look shots and, and he's proven that he can knock them down. Um and I'm really not too worried about the offensive side, but it's the defense that really takes him over that next level. Um, defensive rating of 106, like this team can play defense, and that is majorly put on the shoulders of Chris Mid, Giannis Antetokounmpo, and, and Eric Bledsoe. Yeah, if those three guys aren't out, win shares. Yeah, yeah if, if those three guys aren't out there, um, it, it might be different of what what this team's success can be. But when you look at Chris Mid's defensive win shares, like you were saying, 3.6, and yeah. we, I mean, we've looked at so many numbers this 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 year. Um, I don't remember defensive win shares like being that high. Like, I, I, <laughs> like obviously, I mean, and I don't look at Paul George's defensive stats I'll pull because it up just Paul, to give you a comparison. Because Paul George is just disgusting. Yep. Um, but like, you, I, you don't have to question Paul George. Is pretty much what I'm saying. So you don't need <laughs> stats to prove your point with Paul George. Um, but at least looking Paul at Paul George what, being like the defensive player of the year, basically. Yeah, I know he I mean, wasn't. Mm, uh, four point nine for Paul George. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like. He is not. Year before he's was not, three point nine. He's not elite. Like, that's the whole point. Uh, Chris Mid at, at defense, but he is right there. Yep. Um. So that that's the thing is he he adds not only just that offensive three point shot, um, but he he does just bring everything to uh this team. I mean, at least he's just so well rounded and he's he 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 ties in uh you know Giannis's uh. Giannis's play, play style, style yeah. uh, perfectly. And and looking at Rudy Gobert, Rudy Gobert's at 5.7. So yeah, like, there, there's a reason these guys are... <laughs> shout out those guys. Um, but Chris, Chris Mid's a stud. And let's move to the, the, the other three guys, Jimmy Butler, Paul George, and LeBron James. Um, yeah. All the two guys on a new team, Clippers, and, and, uh, Clippers for Paul George and Butler for Miami Heat, and then LeBron at one. I mean... There's what is no there discussion to say? around LeBron James. He's just LeBron James. Um, he's the I'm best player. I'm shocked that Ricky didn't put him at one. Paul George. Oh, and, you thought? I thought Ricky would have done it. Because there's 
because he's a better defender and he scored more points last year and he's on a better team and Los Angeles is the true uh, the Clippers are the true Los Angeles team. I thought that was going to be Ricky's uh, well, Ricky's I mean, like, but Ricky's not stupid. All of those things you said except for that last one are correct though. He is what? a better defender and he, he did score more points. He scored like up. He's on more. a better team. What are you trying to say? <laughs> Are you trying to say Paul George is I'm better? Not, I'm not trying to say that. I'm just saying those are all valid points. Um, but no, like LeBron James, if healthy. But those are the only valid points. Yep. That's the thing. That's what Rick, Ricky you is You got very, your mountain of facts here, and you've got your, like, I can I can pick these points. And yeah. Again, like I said, Ricky isn't stupid. Ricky put LeBron number one, yep. like he should have. Yep. But Ricky is also very good at creating arguments. He is. And he would have picked those Missy three things Ricky. that people are, are, are tough at are, are doing. Like, if I was creating an argument, that's exactly what I'd do. Yep. And Ricky, again, is not stupid. He would pick the three things that he can win. At, MVP and, voting and last year. Under. Paul George beat him. But the biggest thing is just LeBron's health. Yeah. And and if LeBron is healthy, he is still a stud. And what, I mean, he, LeBron was like... His I'll, first injury. I'll, like, 0. .8 points behind Paul George. <laughs> I think Paul George was at 28.2. LeBron was at 27.4. And also... Paul George can't do what LeBron does assist rebounding wise. Yeah, and, no. and I mean, also when LeBron wants to score, he'll drop 50 on you. Right. That's the thing is LeBron James can and will do anything he wants to you. Like that's that's mm-hmm. the unfortunate problem on the basketball court. He's just the best player in the game right now. Um, the Paul George, Jimmy Butler thing, though, I always have fun with that because we went back Why? and forth, back, like looking back in history. Yeah, it was always like we I think we had had that argument three to five to seven times about who's the better guy between Paul George and Jimmy Butler back we, and forth. We had it last year. Uh, Jimmy Butler ended up beating out Paul George for the best by one point, 83 to 82. Yep. You and Ricky had Paul George below Jimmy Butler. Yep. I am the smart person in the group, and I had Paul George above Jimmy Butler. And yep. I remember, uh, but I'm also always been like down you, on, on, on You've Jimmy always been Butler. anti-Jimmy because um, he's just a knucklehead. He causes controversy. His teams hate him, supposedly, yeah. except for that you know, when you drag out the uh, third unit and you, you take it to the starters and you show these spoiled brats who get contracts, not that good, are you? 2017, I wasn't, though. Uh, Jimmy Butler, we all had him at five. Paul George was at six. Yep. Um, they've always been neck and neck, I'm pretty sure. And then 2016, no, they absolutely have been. Uh, I Oh, no, Paul George. In, in 2016 was different. Paul George actually beat out Jimmy Butler. Uh, Paul George was three for all of us. And then Jimmy Butler was five for you. Ricky had him at six and I had him at five. Yeah. Uh, I had him above Carmelo, which... Nice. Nailed it. Um, <laughs> Ricky also had Kawhi below Paul George, which that's a hot take. Um, you also had Paul George above Kawhi Leonard. What the fuck? Kawhi oh, Leonard too. wasn't that good. Jesus Christ. That year. We all had Kawhi Leonard below Dude, Paul What year George. was this? 20... 2016. Yeah. Um, anyways, uh, that's wrong. Now, uh, <laughs> well, yeah, now looking back. That's what I meant. Like, It's fun to look back at that because like, the argument was always Jimmy Butler is a better primary ball handler and like solo guy. But if you want someone who's a great team player, like Paul George will make your mm-hmm. team better, Jimmy Butler is just a better player. And now I think it's the point where it's, no, Paul George is just a better player through and through, no questions asked. Jimmy Butler is an incredible, tough defender. He works. He's got the best work ethic I've seen probably. Yeah. But he's also cancerous to some locker rooms. <laughs> he's got such a strong personality. And if it's not his way, he's going to let you know about it. And I think that's what's kind of driven them apart in my mind. And I think the biggest thing, too, is what if Paul George didn't break his leg and how, where oh would he God. be at? I yeah. mean, that, that's that's the thing that I look at is you know, you could bring up all that stuff because you're, you're not wrong with Jimmy Butler's personality and, and the way that he's you know gone from yeah. team to team. And you know it's always been something with Jimmy. Um, but with Paul George, you now look at where he just hit. And now you wonder if he would have hit it sooner if he didn't have break, break, broken his leg in that disgusting way. Yeah. Um, Paul George, extremely athletic, just a smooth basketball player, and, and, and such a great defender, high energy. And he was playing hurt, too. Yeah, and, and he's playing hurt with the elbow. But like you said, he's a team player as well. He'll do yeah. anything for that team. He'll play right next to what, what uh, Russ and just you know do exactly what this team needs. Yep. And he not only did that, he took it to the next level. And he, and he became an MVP-type player this year, and that was phenomenal to he's see. He's an incredible player. Now, I'm going to ask you the question. Yeah. And I don't know if it's going to be a difficult one or not. Is it LeBron James the best player? No, it's, oh. it's Kawhi Leonard and Paul George. Who would you rank as the better three? Because oh. I know Kawhi is going to be a four for us because of the way oh, our so rankings Ka- spaced out. But if Kawhi were on this list as a three, Kawhi, without a doubt, I mean Kawhi's Kawhi's is, in my mind is probably the third best player in the NBA, right behind LeBron and KD. Um, and that if we're if we're taking guys that are playing this year, then he's yeah. two. Um, I think Kawhi, although people are going to say you know Paul George is playing through injuries and all this stuff, 
Um, Kawhi Leonard has that ability to play so steadily every single game, Mm -hmm. but that steadiness is always at like 27, 5, and 5. It's just excellence. With incredible defense. That man pisses excellence. He is so (laughs) consistently phenomenal. Yeah. It's stupid. And I, I think Paul George has that spurts of where he can go off and, and then, you know, he can he, he can come down to earth just a little mm-hmm. bit where Kawhi is going to give you the same exact stat line every single night. And he showed that he can take a team to the championship and he's done it twice now. And he did it with a mid range. And, and he and, yeah, and he did it with a, a mid range jumper. But he was also doing it with the Spurs and he was doing it, you know, we, we, we possibly don't know what could have happened, but if, if Zaza didn't do that, but yeah. he possibly could have taken on the best team by himself. That's true. So God that Kawhi just has this next level to him that I don't think Paul George has. Yeah. And that's not a, a knock on We think Paul George hit his next level this year, right? Yeah. It's not a knock on Paul George. It's just Three guys have it in the league. Kawhi, or Kawhi showed it last year. KD showed it the two times that he won finals where he was just literally like, fuck you, LeBron. Yeah, and the LeBron's fuck you done three that. is great. LeBron's been doing that since like 2003. <laughs> so, I mean, there's three guys that can do that. Yep. And, and and even Steph doesn't have that. Steph's shied away in big moments before. And yes, he's done. He's dealt with injuries a lot. But Kawhi apparently was dealing with injuries that whole finals yeah, run. I mean, and he was still the best player out there yeah so i mean i i'm absolutely infatuated with Kawhi, and Kawhi is better it's gonna make a hard discussion for the for the power forward next week man why Kawhi and Giannis? fuck right i I just put you guys on the line i just said Kawhi's better so i'm sticking with Kawhi. all right right. i don't know if it's gonna be that easy when it comes to the final rankings though it will be Kawhi one Giannis two we'll see and Every Greek fan will be buying tickets to chicago to beat the shit out of us (laughs) Um, we will see i I love Giannis, but yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll tease it a little bit more. But I, I love Giannis, but, you know, who won the ring? You know? All right. So, anyways, let us know your, your top ten. Let us know your top three as well. Is it LeBron, Jimmy, uh, Paul George? Uh, flip Jimmy and Paul George. Uh, as, yeah, as I just Paul feel George like there's too, such a drop-off in, like... This position sucked. Yeah. I mean, this was shockingly. Because it used to be Kawhi and Paul George and Jimmy Butler and... Uh, you know, LeBron James and, and Giannis, I think, at a, at a point, too. And now it's just totally fallen off. We're yeah. just three guys Everybody's, inside of close. Because they've all clumped. Now we've got to space them out as far as their actual position. So yeah. it works out that way, though. Well, and now teams are getting smart and putting all the guys that were, like, all the great 30 guys mm-hmm. just at different positions so their teams are yeah. better. Just play all uh, the wings. Yeah, so, I mean, that's the biggest thing. We're not seeing, like, uh, Marvin Williams at what we are. But, like, we're not seeing... <laughs> You know these garbage fours out there anymore. We're actually seeing guys who are talented and you yeah. know, athletic and you know yeah, great, the four fantastic scores. Evolved so much in the last decade. Yeah. So let us know your thoughts on our rankings. Ricky will be back next week. Thanks for watching, and we will see you next time.